pedestal is actually the computer that's running this game. Uh, and I think it costs ten dollars or something you can buy it online. And I, I want to point out the, the ten dollar part because it's probably the least expensive thing in this entire building. Um, and so I, I teach computer science. I also teach game design in the computer science and art department. And one of the, the things I like about games, both at this intersection between sort of art and technology, is very interesting. Uh, it's also the fact that they're, they're a very different kind of art. In fact, they're, they're only recently being recognized as art. Uh, but they are widely recognized uh, as art, I think, sort of with the main institutions, for example, the Smithsonian uh, so now has a video game exhibit that's going on this summer. And what's interesting about games as art is it's the same art that film and, and comic books and sort of other forms have followed, which is that we often have this notion of high art and then sort of popular culture. We separate these in our minds, we put these value judgments, and sometimes there are dollars attached to those value judgments, like the $10 game. Uh, but in practice, there are many things that we hold up, you know, whether it's a Shakespearean play, you kind know, of a pipe organ, if you, even you know, works by Michelangelo, that you know, we look at as high art today, but at the time, you know, these are things that were being done on commission, they were being considered sort of the popular art of their day. They weren't rock concerts, they were organ concerts. If they had rock instruments, then they would have elevated the organ and said that's this high thing that we would get today as this church person. Um, and so in that context, I'm really interested in games as popular art because I, I think they're part of this art where they really influence our culture. So over 60% of Americans, and this number's growing very rapidly in cell phone games, play games. And it's a huge part of our culture. And they really reflect the way that we think about our lives. And they also influence them. And what I like about, particularly about popular art, is this notion that it has to both succeed at doing something interesting, it has to communicate, in many cases, both sort of visually and at a deeper subconscious level, uh, but it also has to entertain, and it has to be sort of commercially viable. So there are art games which are designed specifically for museum shows, in the way that there, there are paintings that are designed specifically to be sold as high art. But most games are designed to be popular art, and to succeed at sort of both levels is particularly interesting. And of course, very few things do succeed. So there, there are millions of paintings, and very few of them, that we sort of curate and decide that we want to collect and look at. And I think Limbo is one of these games. And what's interesting about all games, I think Limbo really personifies, and that this sort of part of the key idea of what separates games from other media is, of course, it's interactive. But the interactive element means that there's two things going on. There's the surface level, where there's, you know, there's a story you're being told, a story that you're supposed to be going through. And in the case of Limbo, it's this little boy who's the protagonist who has to find his sister in this sort of hauntingly beautiful and, and, and terrifying lost forest. But then that, that's really just sort of the setup. That's what gets you into the game. But that's not really the, the narrative in the sense of a dynamic arc and a character change. So what's really going on in the game is not the setup, sort of what we call the frame tale, the theme. It's what's happening inside your head. So again, you are the dynamic character. And this, this is why the interaction is what makes this both unique and essential. So you, you can't take a book and then reinvent it as a video game, or vice versa, because it doesn't work. You're just translating sort of the surface story that was actually irrelevant. In fact, you can play this game without me having told you that he's looking for his lost sister. So what's happening in, in Limbo, and it's so neat, is that they tell you almost nothing. So they tell you there's a joystick, you've got to find your sister, and there are two buttons, and that's it. So they don't tell you how you're supposed to find your sister, what's going on, the rules of this world, are. and so you're going to explore. And it's really about exploring this sort of lost forest, and in the forest you're going to learn things, and you're going to learn sort of the rules of the game. And part of what's neat about this one is that as you learn the rules of the game, it changes the way you think. In particular, it's about solving problems and solving puzzles and teaching you to sort of think about puzzles in different ways. So Cynthia is going to demonstrate the game now. <laughs> Cynthia has never played the game so this is going to be exciting. <laughs> so as she walks back and forth, you see there's, there's a nice parallax and things fading in and out of the distance. And she's going to, if you walk over to the right, So as she comes to the other row, uh, she's going to start, okay, so here's some spiky gears and a rope. She's climbing the rope, and we have no idea what's going on and why she's doing this. <laughs> Including some. I don't know. 
try something, you have to explore. Why don't you let go of them? So she's able to affect the world. Things are happening, but she doesn't understand. So let's walk around the other way. Let's go this way. So there's a pit there. It's not falling. <laughs> Why don't you jump over the pit? All right. Okay. So now we found we found a challenge. So she was able to freely explore, and then she found there's these these two sort of bean bag weighting things or punching bag, and she can't get past them. And we noticed that uh, I noticed that you some people. Uh, but when she pulled on the rope, the, the weights went up and down. And so obviously she has to pull on the rope to move them. But there's this problem, which is when she pulls on the rope, it moves the far weight. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you climb, climb up here around me? And hop over to the other side. So now let's go back to our first rope, which pulled the other way. So we need to somehow get both of them up at the same time. But when we let go, it falls down. Climb up the ladder. Uh. <laughs> so hop over to the right, a big jump. <laughs> and jump on your rope. Oh! oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. And this is the fascinating thing about this game, which is that it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's beautiful and it has this really like, spare aesthetic. Uh, and then these horrible things happen to this little boy. And, and, and so it juxtaposes this, you know, freely experiment, everything's going to be okay, and have a good time, with these really horrifying, I mean, it doesn't sort of, you know, glorify the death like some, in some video games, it's, it's these ghastly things happen, you feel bad. But then it instantly restarts. So it teaches you that if, if you sort of do something that's outside of the bounds, you're going to immediately be reset. Uh, but it's sort of using this, it's pulling these emotional leverage, which are building tension, and then releasing it in a way that's so horrifying, it's actually fun. We, we kind of giggle because there's nothing funny about a little boy being crushed by tears. No. To me. <laughs> so now here's the problem. Cynthia and I have no idea how to get past this. <laughs> <laughs> so I leave it up to you as a challenge to come and explore the game and play with it. But the neat thing is if you get past this, it will teach you something. It will change the way you approach problems. And then you'll get to the next problem and you'll find that trying to solve it the same way won't work. And over the course of this whole game, there's this incredible dynamic that happens where you end up actually thinking very differently by the time you reach the end of the game. And I think that's exactly what a good painting or a good novel or a good film or a good sculpture should be doing. And so that's why I think this is a great illusion to this.